and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. Today, we are so excited. In just a little bit, we are going to be joined by Adriana Herrera to discuss her new series, the Las Leonas series. And I am, I've been so excited about this book since it was announced. <laughs> yes, it's always been telling us all about it for a while. And I have to say, I personally am not all the way through the book yet, but I'm really excited about it. I was really wanting to devour it. I was reading it this morning. <laughs> and like was almost late to work because of it. I really want to finish it. <laughs> it's really good. Yes. And that particular book is A Caribbean Heiress in Paris. And that is out on May 31st. So it's almost out. Uh, we were so lucky to get some advanced copies of it so we could be ready for this interview. So now is the time for you to go pre-order that book if you haven't pre-ordered it already, or you can pick it up at the end of this week because it's almost here. Yes, it is. You definitely want to pick that up. And if you guys don't already know about the Las Leonas series, then Las Leonas follows three Afro-Latinx heiresses on the girls' trip of a lifetime as they find love in Paris at the 1889 World's Fair. So we get to go to the continent <laughs> this week. Yes. And enjoy some delicious Parisian food and all the sights and smells of Victorian era Paris. Absolutely. And it is the place to be. <laughs> That's for sure. Yes. Before we get into our interview with Adriana, I just want to remind everyone, if you weren't here last week or you somehow missed it, we have announced our Patreon. Yes. And we are recording this episode before the launch of our Patreon. So uh, hopefully you guys have already visited it, checked it out, maybe even pledged your support to us. But if you want to find out more about that and see what it's all about, you can do that at patreon.com slash TN Strumpets. T is in Tom, N is in Nancy Strumpets. We are also going to be guesting on another podcast this month and next month. We are on Pod and Prejudice on May 31st and June 14th. And we are going to be on there discussing the 2008 steamy Sense and Sensibility miniseries. Yes, and I have been watching it in preparation and wow, it starts off for real steamy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is a different sense and sensibility than I'm used to. Um, so tune in for our thoughts on that soon. Yes. And without further ado, let's get into our interview with Adriana Herrera. So today we are so lucky to be joined by Adriana Herrera. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast to talk about your new series with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk with you guys. Yes, we're so excited. We have been talking about this for a while on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. We like to do books we're looking forward to, and this has been top of the list. So we were very excited to get a chance to read it and chat with you. And we like to break the ice with our toughest question, I think, that we ask on every interview so that it's everything is easier from here. Um, but do you have a favorite romance novel? Oh, yeah. That's a hard question. We um, like to really start tough here. <laughs> um, I would. Uh, that's that's so hard because even like in subgenres, you know, mm -hmm. like I have favorites, and I've been reading romance for a really long time, like since I was thirteen, and I'm forty three, so that's like three decades. <laughs> um, so it's hard. I would say histor in the historical realm. realm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, probably like OGs, oh, like. Ones that came out probably more than 20 years ago, mm -hmm. Lord of Scoundrels is like uh, my top mm -hmm. all time favorite. Like Jessica Bennett is like everything. <laughs> um, I love, I really love, um, Lisa Claypass. Like, I would mm. say probably from hers, my favorites are again, The Magic and mm. um, Marion Winterborn mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Sarah McLean. 
as women for authors and I really can't pick a favorite of her. So I guess I can't answer that with one book. Sorry. Well, that's why we ask it. I think that it is it always inspires an interesting conversation and usually there's a good few books to add to, you know, to your TBR. If you haven't read those, I have read all those. I agree. They're all excellent books. <laughs> yes. Excellent. But also that also gives us a perfect segue to have you tell us a little bit more about you and your history with romance. Yeah. I mean, I've been reading romance always. I'm a big reader, always mm-hmm. been a big reader. Like I think like my identity and my family is, She's always reading. So I've always been a, but I discovered romance like pretty early on. My mom bought me books all the time. She, she was very encouraging of my reading. So she bought me this like YA historical series that was Austrian, but translated into Spanish. I grew up in the Dominican Republic. So, um, you know, the bookstores had books in Spanish and they were translated from German into Spanish and they were about uh, an Austrian princess and it was like all these books about this romance with this boy that she was in love with and that was it for me um <laughs> from then on I you know just read a lot of romance it's always been a real place of comfort for me and then um somewhere along the line probably in the last 10 years I really started thinking about just writing a romance um and when the election happened, the 2016 election, mm-hmm. um, where a lot of us were having serious existential crises. Uh-huh. <laughs> and still are. <laughs> yes, it's, it has not stopped. Yeah. Um, I was really compelled to write that, like stories that reflected like my own experience. Like, you know, like basically like almost 30 years into reading romance, a lot of it. I had still not read a book where I could see my full self in. Like I had not read a book with a Dominican protagonist. I had not read Mm -hmm. a book centering like my culture, Caribbean culture. So I thought I could do that. And it was something that probably would bring me joy in the midst of a lot of difficult mental time that we were all living in. So that's why I decided to write. I I, I really felt like this is a good time to just do something that will bring me joy. So I decided to write a romance novel. Love it. I absolutely love it. It's so great to channel that love. And also, (laughs) you know, you wanted to see yourself represented in these books. And you know what? We do too. And we (laughs) think the world's a better place for it. Good. And you have written... I believe mostly up until this point, contemporary romances. Yeah. So what drew you to the Victorian era and what made you want to venture into writing historical romance? So, I mean, historical romance as a subgenre was really like what made me fall in love with romance. Mm -hmm. That was like kind of where I entered. Like I was like reading a lot of Joanna Lindsay and (laughs) Julie Garwood and like those authors, like as a teen, I I love just like, the the vibe and the the setting the dresses the swoony the rompiness of it i felt like romance like like in historical romance also like has that like bigger story mm-hmm. so um i love historical romance I, I have always loved it but also like it was one of those subgenres that in the end like began to become really difficult for me to read because of a lot of the elements that are not addressed in it. So it was like one of those places where like, I wish that I, like, I love this and I wish that there were more romances with a lens that's like a lens like mine, you know, that's, that's seen it from the perspective of a woman who has been born and raised in a different place in a different body than a lot of the romance that's out there set like in the historical subgenre. So to me, it was both of those things. I love it, and I find so much joy, and I find these stories so delicious. And yet, I also feel like there's more, there's a need for the world of like the worlds that are explored in historical romance and the histories that are explored to be bigger. Yeah. Yes, we agree absolutely. As, as a lover of historical fiction in general, like I just. I love history. I love learning new things. I love learning about new people. And so to get that introduction to something I never had heard of before from the moment I opened the book is just really great. 
I think too, like Kelsey and I are pretty much only historical romance readers, so much so that we have a podcast all about historical romance. Um, <laughs> and I think that the probably the best thing about this whole journey um, that we've we've done since starting this podcast is, you know, we read historical romance for exactly the same reason, the kind of the almost the fantasy of it. You know, it is it's a little bit larger than life and it is it feels familiar and yet kind of fantastical. And there's just so much about it. And I love Dukes and I love the nobility. Like, that's so fun. But. I think that exactly as you're saying, you know, since 2016 and, and and continuing today, there's just been, especially in the world, but also within romance, like just a little bit of some eye opening. And I think that my as a as just a passive reader of historical romance, I didn't see the inherent issues with the genre. And now as a kind of like critic of it, I do see those issues and I'm really glad for that. And I'm just really excited to see more and more interesting stuff. And I think my evolution as a reader is that I'm a little bored with kind of like some of the same stuff. Some of the, you know, really traditional romance written really well is still wonderful to explore and to read and to enjoy. But I find myself increasingly wanting more from from the genre. I want to see new things and I want to read about different characters. And I think that that only helps me grow as a reader and a person. So I think that's why we're also like really excited to talk about this book with you today. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I, I really wanted to get right, and it, it is as someone that knows exactly what I love about historical romance, and as a writer, like, I'll read people like Sarah McLean or Lisa Claypass, Loretta Chase's Laura Scandals, which, again, is, like, <laughs> canon. It's, like, yeah. <laughs> to, like, figure out those things that I find delicious, right? Like, the things that I can again and again read and always delivers for me in that, like, satisfying way like oh my gosh like the glove moment and the <laughs> Laura Scoundrels or like <laughs> when Reese goes like gets her at the train station and Marin Winterborn like those moments of like this is like why I read romance because this will always be just so good for me and so to me like it was that piece of I think one of the things that has to happen in those moments where like when people become aware or just like consciousness racing about a specific thing that wasn't there before is that there has to be like stages. And I think like maybe five or six years ago, we were in that stage of like recognizing that the diversity in romance wasn't enough, that we needed to be there, that like that we had to like open more spaces for people writing from an experience that wasn't like cis, white, straight experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so that happened. And I think now we're in a place where like, we're here and like our books can't just be like the lesson books, the mm -hmm. educational books, the books that tell us about all the issues that we've had. <laughs> like we have to be in a place where our books are fun books. Like I wanted this book to be delicious in all the ways that I find historical romance delicious and just blending, folding into it what it would have been like for a woman who was a black Latina to be in Paris and living and trying to do business. Right. So I think, and like, I think the piece of it is because I have that lived experience, I mm -hmm. can do it with nuance, right. Without having to like hammer it down. Like one thing that I tried to do was like, I made the decision that at no point in that book was Lucilana going to be humiliated by anyone. Mm -hmm. um, on the page, right? Like if there was going to be a, if, if that was going to happen, the conversation that was going to happen was about how Evan as a white man could had to deal with that. Like how he had to grapple with that reality. Right. And it wasn't mm -hmm. like for my heroine to be like broken down on the page. And so that was something that I very intentionally made. And, and like the conversations happen and you know, and like, those moments when I have them in the book, because I felt it was important to have them, like those conversations happen, but not like by burdening my heroine mm -hmm. with being humiliated on the pager. I don't know if that makes sense. 
No, it absolutely does. I mean, you want the reality of experience, you want the nuances of it, but at the same time too, you don't want the architects of that nuance to be like the destroying of a character either. Yeah. And I think that also as someone who's been, you know, lucky enough to read this book, that really comes through, like everything that you described really comes through. And yet as a reader, you still really do feel the struggles that she's facing. Like, you know, she's a businesswoman trying to get stuff done and and running into obstacles. And you still, you still have those, like the, the push and the pull of the kind of the stress, but not the, the, the heaviness, like you're talking about. There's certain things that like you, you were talking about kind of like keeping the magic a little bit. And I think that, I think that everything you said really translates on page. So very, very cool to kind of hear about the the process behind that, because I think that I don't think I necessarily realized that as the reader, but maybe there were a couple places where I thought, uh oh, like, are we going to get into that? And then instead it took a really different, like you said, a different perspective or a different turn. And it was more rewarding as a reader because either you didn't quite expect that or it, you had a different emotion that you got to feel versus what you thought maybe you were going to have to like brace yourself against. So or I've already gushed, but it was a really, really wonderful book to read. Good. Thank you. I, I had to write it three times. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> so I am glad it ended up, um, doing what it needed to do because it was hard first because I've always yeah. written contemporary before this and mm -hmm. then also like really trying to kind of it was almost like I kept saying like I had to turn the dial to a very specific setting and it like really took me a few tries to get there because it was me maintaining my voice and kind of going after the themes that I go after in the books that I write and also like grounding it into like that mood and that feel of historical romance, which is really different than contemporary. And also like making it sound like it's me. <laughs> so it was like really a lot of different components, but I'm glad that it seems to have worked. And speaking of writing it three times and dialing it in, how did you first get the idea for the Las Leona series? And how long have you been working on it? Is it something that you've kind of had in the back of your head that you finally took the time or did it kind of spring forward as you were writing your other books? So I knew like I, when I got the idea for, it, I knew that I wanted to write a historical next and I was mm -hmm. like toying around with different ideas. I'm really, really, really obsessed with Edith Wharton. Everybody that knows me knows this, like it's, it's like a problem. <laughs> so I, I was I was thinking of actually doing um, reimagining of Age of Innocence, House of Mirth, and Ethan Frome, which are three of my favorite books of her. Of her, so I was playing around with that, but like it wasn't taking. So then, um, just serendipitously, I was researching because I was going to Paris with my family. I was going to Paris with my partner and my daughter um, right at the beginning of twenty. 20 and in 2019 like in the fall I was like researching whenever I go to a new place I always like google like Dominican mm -hmm. plus the city I'm going to just in case something awesome and Dominican is going on and at this place that I'm going to so I found this article from like maybe like 10 or 15 years ago talking about how the Dominican Republic had been invited to the 1889 Universal Exposition in Paris, where the Eiffel Tower had been unveiled and a lot of new things were presented for the first time, and saying that our pavilion had been snubbed by King Leopold of Belgium because our president had borrowed money from Belgium and didn't pay it back. So we basically oh. got the we got the cut direct. <laughs> our entire country got the cut direct at the World's Fair in Paris in 1889. And I was just like, this is really interesting and delicious. So I have to research it more. So I mm -hmm. ended up finding all this information about that World's Fair that really was like the first global um, event that had happened, like in world history. Like there were dozens of countries there and for the first time certain latin countries were invited to a global 
forum as independent nations, not as colonies. So 13 Latin countries were there, um, three of which were Mexico, Venezuela, and Dominican Republic, which are the places where the three heroines in the series come from. So that was the idea for it. That's amazing. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty serendipitous. So then you you found this article and where did you go from there? Because it does feel like this is a very richly researched book. What kind of research did it take to craft this series and how did you tackle it? And like, what kind of sources did you use? Because it feels so... It feels so natural and like just vivid and yet like not, not fantasy at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, so I did a, a lot of research. Like I researched for a year, maybe a little bit more. And, and thankfully, there is a lot of information. I, my mother made me take French for 10 years when I oh, was wow. like from elementary school until uh, the end of high school. So I can read in French, which was great because um, the National Archives in France are available online and they have like a full like archive just of books, guidebooks, and all the maps that were from that World's Fair. So there's like a 300-page guidebook that the French government made before the World's Fair for people visiting with basically like detailed information and illustrations for each pavilion. So like I could just go online and read basically like, this is what the Dominican Republic's pavilion had, how many exhibitors came, what they were showing, an illustration of the pavilion itself. And they had that for basically like every single pavilion that was there, a map of the fairground. So I knew exactly where the DR's pavilion was, which was right, like right under like um, one of the big legs of the Eiffel Tower. All of the Latin countries were kind of clustered together. So that was like that part of the research. And then God, There's I love Dominic history. <laughs> I'm like, Sorry, I love you history said too. that my eyes just got huge and I was like, what? This is amazing. <laughs> it was honestly like, I love history too and research. So for me, it was like literally like I had to stop myself. But I mean, you, there was, there's a, a couple of journal articles too about the presence of Latin America at that World's Fair. So mm -hmm. There were about 5,500 presenters that came from Latin America. Um, the biggest delegation was from Mexico. And there's like many, many articles done about their pavilion specifically because they chose to do their, their pavilion not in like a neo-colonialist style. They chose to do it in the, in a pre-Columbine style. So theirs was like an Aztec palace and it's like amazing. And I'm going to talk a lot about that that palace in the third book because it's Aurora's book and she's from Mexico. But anyway, so there was a ton of, of information about the Wait, I'm the so fair. sorry. It's the third book. I have to wait till the third book for her? Oh, yes, fuck. sorry. The next book is... <laughs> so sad. I feel like that hero, I need to build him up more. Uh, because I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. he is just like... <laughs> He was not supposed, this is a, just like sidebar. He was not the hero I had planned for that book at all. He was uh -huh. not at all going to be a hero. But by the time I was done with this book, I called my editor and I was like, remember how I sold you a book with another hero? Like, it's going to have to be him. And she's like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so I feel like I'm still getting to know him because he kind of like really kind of yeah. jumped out of the page for me in the process of writing. But Anyway, the other <laughs> part of my research was um, there's a Dominican um, studies center here in, in New York City. I'm very mm. lucky to live here. And this is the kind of the heart of the Dominican diaspora is New York City. It's in Washington mm -hmm. Heights and City College, which is in the area where our diaspora kind of is, um, has a Dominican Institute. And it's they have a ton of archives of every of our history. Right. So I someone put me in touch with the library and there and I was trying to research like is it viable for a Dominican woman in that time to have been the head of a business right so I was trying to figure out could this be viable was this a thing and he hooked me up and sent me so many articles one of which had all this amazing information about trade and commerce in the DR and it turns out that in the second half of the 19th century in the Dominican Republic, um, they kept pretty good recordings of 
who was doing commerce and the majority of liquor salespeople were women in the DR Hmm. at that time. Wow. And so I was like, okay, so this tracks, like I could definitely do this. And that's where I kind of got the idea of Lusalana, you know, working with um, women merchants and having like their rum being sold by like a like a sales force of women which was totally viable because most of the people selling liquor in the dr at that time were women so that's the kind of research i did i could go on for hours and hours but it was a (laughs) lot and it was very fun to find out all this information that i didn't know before this is so exciting gosh yeah, Kelsey is Kelsey is our history buff. My husband's a researcher by um, profession, and I I am continually just astounded by people who can do research because I'm not the kind of person who has patience for it. Um, but I love reaping the rewards. <laughs> yes, so. mine too. Mine is too. He's he's a professor, so he uh. that's what he does for a living as well. <laughs> See, I just like I just am a facts person. Our podcast always has like a historical fact because when we read these historical romance novels, there's usually like interesting historical tidbits. And so like I would go down rabbit holes just researching it anyway and looking at it. And so then I was like, we need to put this in because I think I'm not the only one who wants to know more about this. (laughs) Yes. I'm the type of person that reads a history book and then from that book ends up buying another 10 books because they (laughs) mentioned something in the book that's Mm -hmm. sold and I buy that source. So yes. Um it was very good. Like I have a thing in the in the book about um, Evan gives her a wedding gift that's like a corset that's like she calls uh-huh. it like a truncated, and that's actually true. Like the first like prototype for a bra was presented at this World's Fair by this woman Hermine Cadol, and it wow. was um, the first time that someone had like broken a corset so that it wasn't like completely over the ribs. And that was kind of like the the grand great great grandmother of the bras that we're using now. Wow, so little stuff like there's a lot of information about that fair if you look for it. So and there was all kinds of like cool stuff that were being that were introduced by entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. So to speak a little bit more detailed about the book, a Caribbean heiress in Paris is out in a few days. So that's really exciting. And we've already prompted our uh, listeners to go pre-order it if they haven't. However, can you tell us a little bit about it? And then I know you spoke already about women running the liquor trade, but why did you specifically choose rum for your main character? Well, rum is kind of like synonymous with the Caribbean. And so <laughs> since she's from from the Dominican Republic, which really was kind of like the birthplace of like the sugar economy, which has a ter- terrible history. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So I thought I could, you know, start there and then build a le- a business that had a legacy that was not horrific. Right. So I was very ca- like, very careful of saying like, this makes sense because we, grow great sugar cane, we make great rum, how can I make reframe that and make it something that is positive, right? So that was kind of like my idea. If I'm going to have, if they were exhibiting rum at the World's Fair and I, and I want to have a heroine there doing business, like it just makes sense that she's there to mm-hmm. sell rum. And I just like, if he was, I decided he was going to be from Scots, from Scotland. So I was like, if he's from Scotland, he's got to be making whiskey and she's got to be making <laughs> rum and it's got to be how like they come together Mm -hmm. yes and another one of the themes in the book i feel like is kind of like medicine and traditional medicinals um it seems to be a big theme and also in the novella that you um published as well in the collection which uh i did not write down the name and the name escapes me right now the duke makes me feel yes um that one she's she's also a um apothecary owner, I believe, in that one. And then one of the Leonas is a doctor. So I'm interested if you could speak a little bit on your inspiration for all of the kind of medicinal things. And I also had another note that our our hero in this book uses papaya seeds for contraception. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that one. <laughs> yes. Well, t- the, the piece of the medicinal, so like, I mean, like women, like, 
Dominican culture is very much a matriarchy. So like women pass, you know, from generation to generation, like different ways to cure things like balms, things that you can make infusions that you pass on that cure things typically for like issues for people with uteruses, right? Like people <laughs> who have wounds. So that, that was kind of my inspiration because in my, my family is full of, of healers. Like my grandmother was that type of person that always had a something that she could give you. If you had a headache, if your stomach hurt, like she had some kind of concoction, usually it involves <laughs> some kind of herb or root or something like that. So that's part of it. And, and I think culturally, that's a big thing. Like women are healers in, in the Dominican Republic. And for, um, Aurora, I was just doing research. Aurora is the third heroine and she is Afro-Mexican and she is a doctor. I was just doing research and found that the first woman who was licensed to practice medic medicine in Mexico was like in 1884 or something like that. And mm. she was, um, you know, Afro, Afro-Latina. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. Ah. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so that was kind of just like coincidental, but also great because that's something that like excites me just to write about that. And then with the papaya seeds, that's like a known thing in the Caribbean that like you shouldn't eat a lot of papayas because that like if you were trying to have kids, you have to stop eating papaya. <laughs> and so that's just something that's a known thing. And um I didn't realize that actually what is the contraceptive is the seed. I didn't actually know that until I started researching. But again, to me, it was always like giving <laughs> Evan some of the responsibility there in the relationship of like, mm -hmm. she's, she's of course looking to get herself her own contraception, but for him to like be the kind of man that mm -hmm. doesn't burden his sex, like his sexual partners with doing all the work about like being careful. What an idea. What a, kind of <laughs> a man who's yeah. culpable in, in conceiving a child. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew that they could also be the ones taking care of not impregnating people? Yeah. As someone who is pregnant right now, by my by choice, uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow. Yeah. So we've mentioned a few characters already, but do you have a character or book from the series that is closest to your heart? Is there a book in the series or a character that has most excited you or like you were most excited to explore? I, Apollo really kind of, uh, I mean, I, I, I won't mention what, where Apollo comes from because I guess that's a little <laughs> bit of a spoiler, but like there's a character <laughs> named Apollo who I ended up really enjoying writing and he wasn't planned. He was an unplanned character. <laughs> um, and, and he really was interesting. But to me, probably the character that's probably the most like me is Manuela. And oh. Manuela Aurora and Luzana are like inspired, like kind of like my really, but my best friends from high school and college. Um, and I probably was more of the Manuela in the group. Like I'm the <laughs> one that's always going to like get you into trouble and like, you end up like staying up all night because I like led you astray. So Manuela, I'm really excited to um, write her book because it's a lesbian romance and mm -hmm. it's um, her and a duchess who is um, also Latina. She's Chilean and American. And so I am excited about that because A, she's an artist. So I'm going to explore like the presence of Latin artists at the World's Fair, which was also like pretty um, significant. We had mm -hmm. a pretty significant presence in the arts. And I want to explore this like academy that existed in Paris at that time wow. that was like basically like the gayest place in Paris. Yes. And it was this academy that had a, like a ton of women who were queer and a, a lot of them were coupled off. And um, I just want to really explore like queer life for women in Paris, which was vibrant and they were having a great time. <laughs> so I really want to explore that because we don't see it as much. Like, I feel like we just don't see as much. Like there's mm -hmm. a lot of gay romance historical, but there's not a lot of like queer women having an amazing time mm -hmm. in the olden times. 
Yes. Yeah. We try or we've been trying to since we started, like I said, we we started with a lot of dukes and straight white people falling in love. And neither of us had even read a gay romance before we started this podcast. And now, I mean, I read all of them. In fact, some of those have been like our favorites and like we really enjoyed exploring them. And I think it's part of the reason is just, again, like you said, it's I I also want to see what a vibrant life they can lead at that time. And I also think it's very thought provoking because it does explore a lot of the negative side of history, but then also like how people have been choosing to live the life they want for centuries. Yeah. And have been living happily ever after. Yes. But where I was where I was gonna just mention is that it has been hard harder to find lesbian romances and historical romance. There are a handful. There are plenty you can find, but I think a handful of of really quality ones. And at the end of the day, like especially for a podcast, I really want to celebrate not just, you know, something because it ticks a box, but also because, you know, I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it. And there's like, you know, it's beautifully written and it, you know, displays all the things you're saying. So I'm really excited that you're <laughs> that that comes next too. I guess I guess I'll wait for <laughs> for number three. <laughs> I know. I'm, I think I have to like work myself up to that hero of the third book. Yeah. <laughs> I I um as soon as you said it, it all made sense. Like it does. There's there's a build up that has to happen, and like you said, not hearing your process, you've got to you know explore him a little bit more. But um, I'm really excited also for Manuela's book. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right now the series is set, I believe, for three books. Are you hopeful? Do you wish? Do you want to tell more stories in this particular world? Or like, how do you feel about that? So I have, like, my attention span is very, like, I I admire and I'm in awe of people who can write <laughs> nine books in the same series. <laughs> like the Bridgertons, for example, like I'm in awe of you that wouldn't be able to like rate it, be able to deliver that many books. Yeah. I get really restless. Um, so I don't know, like, could there be? Yes. Like there's a lot of characters that I could possibly see getting a book. Like there's a, um, Amaranta, who's the cousin of um, Lusalan, and also they're kind of to help with Lusalan's little sister. Like, she's like an interesting character that I probably could explore more. Or um, Evan's best friend, Raghav, who's uh, a gay man and his like mm-hmm. business partner, um, is also like a really interesting character. But like, that is only like if I have like <laughs> life in me after the third book, then perhaps. <laughs> That's fair. I I also my mind works the same way. Really, like, I can be really task focused, but then like I need it to draw to an end because <laughs> I need to take a break from it and like put my mind somewhere else. Yeah, so I'm like very much about like new and interesting, like the shiny thing right now. So, but it's such a like what I do think is that that particular setting is very like easy to explore different ways like I thought like there's a, a brothel in the book um called mm-hmm. Le Bureau, which means the office and um I've thought about like perhaps maybe that could be a place where like some some characters come out of for books just because I think it's just like a really interesting setting and all the meet cutes happen in that place mm-hmm. in this series yeah I um I picked up on that a little bit. I I really um I I liked that little I well I liked that whole setting and when when you kind of realize as a reader that somebody else has met in that place, it's a really fun moment. So yeah, it yeah. definitely like sets you up for the rest of the the series. Yes. So with this book and the series, what do you hope that the readers are going to get out of reading it? Like, is there any particular hopes that they're going to get out of it? Or are you just trying to tell like a really delicious, interesting story, which you are. It is interesting (laughs) and delicious. I'm not yet finished with the book. And so like when this interview is over, I'm going to go read the rest of it. (laughs) I've been waiting to do it like all day. (laughs) I mean, I think... For the most part, yes, I want them to think it's fun and delicious and just to kind of like, like, be able to experience like all the things that you go into historical romance 
wanting and having it be centered not on, you know, a person who's a white, straight person. And so to Mm -hmm. me, it's like having, it's just that piece of, you know, our books have the ability to give you all those things that you expect from a romance and you can learn a thing or two or gain a gain perspective on something that you didn't had never had to think about but still get like all the thing all the payoff that you want in a romance like the steam the feels the spoons the dress the ballrooms the carriages (laughs) and the train Mm -hmm. making out (laughs) yeah all of that and more (laughs) <laughs> which is the, uh, which is what I have been wanting as a reader. But do you have any advice for maybe you know us straight white readers <laughs> to best support the changes in the genre that you know I've said I want to see, and that you you know you're talking about working so hard to to make a reality? Um, how can we best support that? When I would say read them and recommend them, like. If you like them, of course, because I think that to me, that's the piece of our, our work. It's that we need more visibility. I think that like the landscape is really built for stories that are not ours. So, but Mm -hmm. we also know like romance, like is hand sold. Like most of the romances that I end up buying are because I've listened to a podcast and heard someone like gushing about it. Or a friend has told me, you have to read this one. Um, And so that's the piece. Like, talk about our books. If you read them, talk about our books, share them. Like, keep an eye out for us. Well, hopefully our listeners have heard enough gushing that they've already at least bought (laughs) A Caribbean Heiress in Paris. And uh, I really can't say enough good things about it. I know Kelsey is chomping at the bit to go back and finish it now that she's (laughs) done with work. (laughs) So um, yeah, it's a great book. And I just felt like I can't say enough good things. So however, we can't talk to you all day. (laughs) So um, I guess where we should go next is to ask what is next for Las Leonas series after A Caribbean Heiress in Paris comes out on May 31st, I believe. Uh, and then what's next for you? Um, I write both, right? So I write contemporary mm-hmm. and I write historical. So I have a contemporary coming out in October and then the next Leonas, which um, we don't have a title yet, but I hope it's the one that I suggested <laughs> is coming out on next May. So it's um, Manuela, like I said, and she is an artist trying to get her work presented at the um, World's Fair. And she meets a duchess who mm. is basically like a rake. Like what I'm going for is like <laughs> the Chilean American Dane from Lord of Scoundrels is really what I'm hoping for that I'm going to deliver to readers. So that's what I'm doing. She's very, um, she's very roguish. Um, ah, Duchess. I am. I'm excited. Very to interested. It, for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so we also have a contemporary book coming out. So where should people order your books? <laughs> So you can just find my books at adrenaherararomance.com. The book that's coming out in October is called On the Hustle. And it's about a interior designer who has a business called Bookish Boudoir. And she basically um, designs bedrooms for people in the theme of their favorite book. And she gets an up. I know it's like. Once I started reading, I'm like, I wish this was a real thing because I would hire her to do like my entire house. So she basically <laughs> creates bedrooms around like a person's favorite book. And oh my she, gosh. Gets an op- <laughs> she gets an opportunity to do a reality TV show, but it comes with strings attached from her former boss who is very grumpy and very mean, but turns out it's not so grumpy and not so mean. So that's mm. on the hustle. It's coming out in October. And, um, you can find all my stuff in adrianaherrerromance.com or at, I'm mostly on Instagram at Lajana underscore Herrera. Perfect. Because that was my next question, which is where can people find you? So uh, it sounds like your website and Instagram. Oh, and my newsletter is also a good place because I do give like updates that sometimes don't make it to my Instagram. 
Excellent. Well, I will make sure that we are subscribed to that too, because I want all the updates. I am so very excited. Well, we cannot thank you enough for all your time today. I am just beaming. Uh, I've had such a fun time talking with you and talking about this book. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. This was super fun. I could talk about this forever. Well, maybe we'll have you on again someday. Anytime. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Well, that was a lot of fun. If you couldn't tell from my voice, I had a huge smile on my face and I was like, I was just so excited to talk to her. Maybe I fangirled a little too hard. (laughs) Uh, No, you didn't. I think I was the one because the surprise with all her dropping history knowledge and all the things that she researched and she found and I'm over here like, tell me more. (laughs) Yeah, there's definitely going to be an outtake at the end of just like one of our history tangents. So listeners, go ahead and listen after the credits. And I think that you'll have a little treat for you there, too. So yeah, no, I'm just it was just so fascinating. And I just loved the story of how, you know, it just was like curious. And then just it kind of just came off like a random Google search, you know, and then it brought ideas because then she did more research. And I just everything she was describing about the World's Fair and how she can even see they still have booklets in archives like describing the entire World's Fair and what each pavilion was and each exhibit. Like, that's amazing. It's amazing. And the book, like, really captures that. I think that's why I was so swept away. And she's so right. Um, This may be – actually, yeah, this is going to be in the the later part, but we discussed um, the fact that, like, you know, why aren't more people writing about Paris? And she's right. Like, I'm over here clamoring for, like, something more interesting to read about, you know, in historical romance. Like, I still want all of the swoony carriage rides, Mm -hmm. like she said. But, like, I just want something more (laughs) like, you Mm -hmm. know, like it's like Belle from Beauty and the Beast where she's just like, I just want more. And that that's what I want. I want more. Well, it's really interesting, too, because she talked about why aren't people writing more in Paris. And I remember in Jennifer Ashley's The Madness of um, Lordy Lordy McKenzie McKenzie, and then his brother Max book, both those books take place in Paris. Like there's a good chunk in Paris for both Mac and is and also in Mac and Isabella's book. And so I just found it really interesting because they seem to be having a great time in Paris. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. It's like as a reader of the genre, you you know that you like know people are having fun in Paris, but like, why aren't we seeing more of it? So anyhow, I can't wait. I loved this book. I know I've said it so many times, but like, I just, you know, sometimes when you have a book that you've really been anticipating, like it has, like, it just has an even harder chance of living up to your expectations, mm-hmm. right? Because you, you, you've you put it on a pedestal already, but like this book exceeded my expectations. Like it just, it was such a, a wonderful book to read. And I'm not going to say much more because I just want, you know, I think that our listeners can get enough out of the kind of conversations that we've had around this book Mm -hmm. and this series um, with Adriana. And I just think that um, also, you know, I really want you all to go out and get to experience it for yourselves, like dive in, enjoy. Uh, And then you can all be like me, (laughs) you know, (laughs) desperately waiting for, for book two and book three, which we will get in due time. Yes. And I think that we are waiting for that. In the meantime, check out our Patreon like we talked about at the top of the show because we (laughs) need your support. (laughs) Yes. Your support is so important to us. And you've already shown us your support in so many ways over the past couple of years. But if you don't mind heading over to patreon.com slash T's and Tom and as a Nancy Strumpets to check out our tiers and what we have on offer, we would love that. And our tiers start at $3 and end at $10 a month. And, you know, if that is something that you can manage, we would love uh, for you to join us on Patreon. Yes. And as always, we just like to hear from you or if you just want to keep up with what we're doing, 
without being on Patreon, that's fine too. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at T is in Tom, N is in Nancy Strumpets, and Facebook slash T is in Tom, N is in Nancy Strumpets, and YouTube by searching our name. And also, we just want to say one more thanks to Adriana Herrera. Um, Again, you can order her books, and I think she has linked to signed copies from her indie bookstore, if I'm not mistaken, on her website, adrianaherrera.com. And her Instagram is a great place to find her as well, and that is Ladriana Herrera, um, L-A-D-R-I-A-N-A underscore Herrera. So go ahead and check her out there as well. Follow her and sign up for her newsletter on her website. And again, A Caribbean Heiress in Paris comes out very, very soon. Today, I believe, is the 26th, if you are hearing this on release date. And it comes out on the 31st. So... Go ahead and pre-order that book. We will make sure to link to all of the things Adriana mentioned, uh, as well as a link to pre-order that book, because I love it, and I really hope you all do too. And let's show our support by reading and recommending this wonderful book. Yes, indeed. And speaking of books, what are we reading next time? Well, next time is our first book of June. Yay! And June is Pride Month. And so I think we did not do a great job of celebrating that last year. But this year we are going to do just that. And we are going to be reading The Perks of Loving a Wallflower by Erica Ridley. Yay! It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers! <laughs> yes. So we will be reading that next time. And that features... A, and we're going to stumble over talking about it next week too, but that features someone who would be described as non-binary today, um, although the character refers to herself as she and her. So it is a lesbian romance, but with one of the people would be described as non-binary today. Yes. Um, so it's a really interesting read. This is also the second book in the Wild Winchester series, which we talked about our love of the Duke heist last year on a promo, which was actually a really lovely one. So that's why this is a fun one to read, because we get to see more of the Wild Winchesters. Yes. And if you like the TV show Leverage, then this series is for you. And I like the TV show Leverage. So. Anyhow, I'm so excited. Thanks again to Adriana for joining us today. And please join us next week as we read The Perks of Loving a Wallflower by Erica Ridley. And may all your ever afters end happily. loved learning everything (laughs) just so yeah I mean like really I'm still like I'm still like listening to I still have the research thing going around my head and I just think (laughs) you'd be a great person to go to Paris with as well as like all the other places because I feel like everyone else wants to go see the touristy stuff and I was over there like I took my I went to Paris with my family I took myself to like the war museum yeah it was great Because guess what's in the War Museum? (laughs) Hundreds and hundreds of suits of armor, including, Zoe, the suits that were on the horses. Yeah, I did the the carriage museum in a couple different cities um, in Europe, and it was just carriages. And I was like, nobody comes here. I'm the only one here. And it's just these amazing carriages. And I was like, I took myself. No one else wanted to go with me. And I was like, I'm going, guys. Sorry. (laughs) No one one likes that. I mean, I don't know. I find all that stuff about how people lived and what people used, the things that they wore. really fascinating so yeah i mean i the research for this like i wrote like a whole i read a whole book just about like brothels in paris just like the culture and like legislation and like what were the laws because technically it wasn't illegal but you had to have the houses like well like you have to have a sign in there that people knew what, what it was but it wasn't illegal like for example in in London, where it was more regulated. 
my question is how people are not writing more books in Paris because people were like having the best time in Paris. Like, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I did. I was, uh, I'm, I didn't, but I almost minored in art history. And like, you talk about the impressionists and the lives they were living in Paris in the yes. 1880s and 90s, like, and that whole differing art movement and how they like left like the schools and how like they, like all of that's just fascinating. It is. It is. I mean, the, the, the academy that I want, I'm referencing for um, the second one is called Academy Julian. Mm -hmm. And it was an academy that basically prepared people for the exam at the Academy of the Beaux-Arts because it was such a rigorous exam and it was in French. So they prepared foreigners, right? So there was a mm -hmm. ton of Latin people, a ton of people from other European countries, Americans, like John Singer Sargent, who I'm obsessed with, mm -hmm. studied at the, prepared the Academy Julian to take the Academy of the Beaux-Arts exam, right? So like, all these like young artists were coming to France and like living in like Montmartre and like being gay and having an amazing time. And I don't know why people don't write more about Paris. Like in London, you couldn't even eat in the same re restaurant. You could literally have public sex in Paris and it was fine. Like, you were <laughs> like they wouldn't arrest you. It, it is funny because, like, I think that the reference for, like, historical romance, you know, of Regency Victorian readers is, like, Paris is, like, the wild place that someone comes back from. But that's, like, all we hear about. Like, the, the estranged wife comes back from her wild time in Paris to, like, reconcile with the Duke so she can finally have a child. Whatever. You know, it's, like... There, yeah. Like you said, there's so much more interesting stuff. So, like, let's write about her, her great time yes. in Paris instead. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was palaces. Like, for the second book, I, I was doing a little research right now. So, where the American embassy is in Paris, and it's been mm -hmm. there. That's been the American embassy now for almost 150 years or a little more. It was the embassy when the fair was going on. That house belonged to Napoleon's sister. <laughs> and she would host parties where she would literally come out completely naked and have like four men who were like in loincloths, like bring her out. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> and it was just like, I've got to have a party at this embassy just so I can have someone talk about this woman <laughs> being brought out in like, like a, you know, like Cleopatra and like this like dais. So, oh my gosh. It's like all kinds of fascinating stuff that. I don't know what's going on in Paris. There was always, and there's always been such a cult, which is interesting to me. Is there's always been such a huge, like, artists and interesting American people living yeah. in Paris. Like, yeah. the American expat in Paris is like, for almost 100 years, there's such a rich history. And yet, American readers don't seem to be as interested in it for historical romance. I feel like fiction, yes. But like mm -hmm. romance, there's not as much. And there's just a lot of stuff that like is super fascinating. Anyway, I could <laughs> talk about this for a year. And I would just be at your knee just staring at you. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I will spend the next year uh, waiting very impatiently for Manuela's book and to learn more about the uh, – the, um, uh, Academy. And I just yes. can't wait. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Look it up. Academy Julian. And if you're interested right. in John Singer Sargent, there's all kinds of interesting oh, information gosh. about him. Very cool. Yes.